All right, well, good morning. How are you guys doing? Thank you. How are you guys doing today? Spring is in the air. Doesn't matter how late Easter comes, it seems that we're always caught off guard when it does come. And you know, Christmas then is just right around the corner, so you guys can start getting ready for that. Just kidding. My name is Matt Dumas. Why? If you are a parent of toddlers or teenagers, that's probably a question that you have heard before more than once, right? It can be both enlightening and, if we're honest, a little maddening, right? It's a sign of an inquisitive mind, but sometimes it's a little bit of a rebellious heart. You know, if you're any parents of toddlers right now, or that you had toddlers at one time, so parents who, have, who, have e- or who are either going through it, I heard one right there in the back, um, or um, who have survived that kind of that, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> that stage of child development are familiar with why, right? Why is the grass green? Why is the sky blue? Why does that man look so funny up there? And a million other whys. And of course, then if you've got teenagers, the whys happen to be probably around the rules, right? Well, why can I go do this? Or why do I have to do that? And then it's the consequences that are tied to those rules. So, well, why should I get in trouble for doing that, right? So there's two kinds of whys. But, but basically, why is a quest for knowledge. It's trying to figure things out to, to understand better. Why is the question that drives the engineer, uh, that drives the, the scientist or the architect or the artist? That, that why um, is the engine that drives innovation or invention? It pushes technology forward. That In Proverbs chapter 25, Pro, um, Solomon says this, it is It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search a matter out. That why is actually a good question. It's something that, that again, it causes, if we know the the why of something, then we can fully give ourselves to that thing, whatever it is. So today as we continue our story in the book of Acts, we're going to see some folks in Berea who ask their own version of why. Please turn to Acts 17 and let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and for the opportunity to worship you. We know that each and every day, each moment of the day is a gift that you give us. That we're not guaranteed another one. And Father, we just pray that that we would be those who cherish each moment of life that we have. That we would invest it well in the lives of people, Father, and, and in serving you. And Father, I pray that as we spend the time in your word today, this morning, that that Lord, you would guide and direct our thoughts. That we would see once again the the, the simplicity but the beauty of the gospel. And that Father, that we might be encouraged, encouraged to share the good news that we've received with those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take a look at verse 1. Now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus who... who, Sorry whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people." When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men have upset the world and have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. 
They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. So last time we were in Acts, Paul and his companions got off the boat from Troas onto the shores of Macedonia, uh, which is modern-day Europe. Uh, It's a pretty momentous occasion. It's a new frontier for them. They've passed from the east, and now they're in the west. Remember Paul's, um, Paul's, Jesus' Uh, instructions to his disciples, to the apostles. He said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And so here they're going to that uttermost parts of the world thing. They started off in Philippi, and remember in Philippi that, that Paul and Silas, Timothy, and Luke faced some opposition and persecution from the folks there. Uh, that there, uh, Paul had uh, had the audacity to, to cast a demon out of a girl who was fortune-telling. And when he does, the, the folks uh, lost their, their source of revenue, the, the, the girl who's bringing so much bank to them, and so they get a little upset. You don't mess with people's money. And they grab Paul and they Silas and they take them to the town center, and the, the authorities are there, and they, they order them to be beaten with rods. And then they're thrown in prison for the night. The next day, when they get up, the city authorities find out that Paul and Silas are actually Roman citizens. So now they're a little bit nervous, and they ask them to leave quietly. And so Paul and Silas do leave, but not before they go to the church that that they planted there in Philippi, a church in Lydia's house, right? Uh, A church that now uh, likely has a a former demon-possessed slave girl and a Philippian jailer. Three captives that now are part of the kingdom of God. So now, here we are. They, they travel from Philippi. Let's see our map again. Okay, we're going to start over here in Lancaster. We're going to jump on our airplane, and we're going to fly over here. Now, where is this right here? Europe. Europe, and this is Africa. Okay, thank you. There we go. We got to Africa. Uh, and this is Middle East. Okay. This little piece right here? No, I'm kidding. Um, okay, let's go in. All right, so, so they, they uh, got off the boat. They were in Philippi. They're going to travel 100 miles west to get to Thessalonica. Now, they're going along a road that's called the Ignatian Way. Now, that's not going to be on the test, so don't worry about that. But it's a major east-west highway that travels through this part of the country. So, so if you think of the 10 down in L.A., that's kind of what they're going on. They're on the 10 passing to, to Thessalonica. Now, Thessalonica is important. It's it's the largest city in the area, and it's the ancient capital of the second district of Macedonia. That will be on the test, so get ready for that one. Um, Thessalonica, you can tell it has water there, so it has a harbor. Uh, It's a wealthy city, and like Philippi, it's a free city, which means they have the right of self-government there. It's another strategic location for Paul to go to. That's why he's there. But unlike Philippi, Thessalonica actually has a larger uh, Jewish population. Now, how do we know that? They have a synagogue, right? The fact that they have a synagogue tells us there's more Jews in Thessalonica than in Philippi. And so for three Sabbaths, three consecutive Sabbaths, Paul is in the synagogue. Now, it says, as is his custom, we've said this before, why does Paul go to the synagogue when he gets to town? couple of reasons. We'll start with the first reason is there's Jews and there's Gentiles, God-fearing Gentiles. Though the, the thing that those two groups have in common is they know the story, right? They know about the God who created the heavens and earth. They know about the God of Israel. They know about who God is. And they're also expecting, they're looking forward to the Messiah, right. So they're looking for Messiah. So when Paul shows up and he says that Messiah has come, they actually know what Paul's talking about. They're not going, who's that? Right? They're going, ah, oh, what do you mean Messiah's come? Tell me more. Right? So that's their low-hanging fruit. That's why he starts in the synagogue. That's one of the whys. But the other why, I heard someone say it. And we'll see this when we get to the book of Romans. Paul will say often, the Jew first and then the Greek. The Jew first and then the Gentile. 
that although the gospel is for everybody, there is a priority given to the Jews. Now, why might that be? Wow, you guys are doing awesome. Um, Yeah, here's the thing. God made a promise to a man named Abraham. And he said, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That the Jews were the ones who were the ancient people of God. They were entrusted with the Old Testament scriptures. That they were given the promises. right? That they carried that forward all this time up until the time of Messiah. Paul says in Romans chapter 11 that they are a cultivated olive tree. And I know we have a few Jews in here, loud and proud. Okay, good, awesome. You guys are the cultivated olive tree. Very good. And the rest of us, we're a bunch of wild branches that have been grafted in. Right? Paul says we're not the root. We just get the benefits of of those who have gone before, right? And so that's why Paul goes, he starts with the synagogue because he does not want to give up on his people and neither should we. So for three Sabbaths, Paul's in the synagogue reasoning, explaining, and giving evidence. It sure sounds like he's tackling a why question. And Paul does that. What is he going to use when he's um, reasoning, explaining, and giving evidence? Where do you think that's coming from? The Bible, maybe? The Scriptures, right? That, that's where he's going to start. And he says this thing. He says that the, the Christ, the Messiah, had to die and be raised again. Now, where in the world in the Old Testament might he get an idea like that? And I would probably start all the way back in Genesis 3.15. That's probably where I'd start. And you might go to Isaiah 52 and 53 to look at a suffering servant. You might look, go to jump over to Psalm 16 and talk about it, but... but, but Paul says it was necessary. It's not uh, something that just happened out of happenstance, but that God had planned this from the beginning, that the Messiah, the Christ, would have to die and be raised again. And then Paul says, you know what, that guy I've been talking about, you've heard me mention his name more than once, Jesus. Guess what happened to him? He was crucified. And he was raised on the third day just like Messiah was supposed to be. And everything that the Old Testament says about him, everything from Genesis through Malachi that Jesus fulfills, he is the Messiah, he is the man. Let's stop for just a second. Now Paul, he reasons, he explains, he gives evidence. But all Paul has to work from is the Old Testament. Does he have the book of John yet? What about Romans? What about Jude? First Peter? Revelation? What? He doesn't have any of those? All he has is the Old Testament. He doesn't have the Gospels that tell about the story of Jesus and give us all that great information about who he is and, and show us what he's like. He doesn't have the rest of the Old Testament that that, that gives the implications and tells what that means. He doesn't have all that. Hmm. How in the world did he do it then? (laughs) Carefully, I like that. But you know what? You do have the Gospels. And you do have the book of Acts. Acts. And you do have Romans and all of Paul's writings, and you have all of John's writings, and you have all of Peter's writings. You have all of the New Testament. You have it all. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. You have way more than Paul had at that time. So the question is, could you reason and explain and give evidence of who Jesus is? of the significance of his life, death, and resurrection? 
It's something that happened over 2,000 years ago. Why it is important for us today. Could you do that? Could you give a reason for the hope that you have? Are you spending enough time in the Word that, you, that that's a part of the narrative that you know, that you know, that you know, not only what you believe, but why you believe it? So as we've seen on a number of other occasions, some Jews believe... And lots of God-fearers do as well. But the rest of the Jews don't. They reject Paul and the gospel. And it says they become jealous. Now, we said this when they were in Pisidian Antioch. Remember, the the same word was used was jealous. But it's not like they're jealous of Paul. He's getting all the attention. I wish I had more attention. I wish I had more followers on Facebook or on Twitter. But I don't. And I'm really mad at that guy, Paul, because he's so popular. Right? That's not the thing. You see, they're zealous for everything Jewish. Now, remember, we only had a few Jews in this audience. And the rest of you guys are Gentiles. And the few Jews in the audience, they, they know that theirs is the ancient people of God. And Messiah is their hope. He's the hope of Israel. And now all you guys are hijacking their Messiah? You're coming into their kingdom? They're not happy about it. And so you know what they do? They go and get some of you guys from the marketplace, some wicked men. Now, no, I'm not saying you're wicked. Maybe I am. And they go and they form a a protest. Not, Not a protest, sorry. A riot, a mob. They get together a group of people, and they head to Jason's house. Poor Jason. I'm so sorry. Why do you think they go to Jason's house? Why do they just pick some random guy and say, you know what, let's go over to Bob's house today and grab Bob. They go to Jason's house because they expect to find Paul there. And why do they expect to find Paul at Jason's house? Because could it be that Jason's house is the place where the church in Thessalonica is meeting? And where else would you find Paul? At the church, right? And so they go to Jason's house because they're expecting that Paul would be at the church in Thessalonica, which is at Jason's house. But Paul's not there. And so when they get there and they they go, where's Paul? And they say, no, Paul. Well, Jason, you're going to have to do. Now, we've been reading the book of Acts, right? We know it's not good when a, a mob shows up at your house and they knock on the door and say, hey, can, can Jason come out and play? Right? Philippi. What happened in Philippi? With Paul and Silas. Sticks. And they beat them. What happened in Lystra? Rocks. And they beat them. And so here's Jason, and he's getting pulled into the marketplace, and we're going, oh, no, sorry, Jason. That's Paul's fault, not yours. But he gets pulled into the marketplace. And the charges are similar to what they saw in Philippi. In Philippi, uh, they're, they're pagans, right? They, they lost a source of revenue, and they get angry about that. And so they start saying, you know what? These guys, they're, they're, they're stirring up the crowds. They're talking about this guy named Jesus. They're, they're presenting a, a person that, that we're, it's not lawful for us to follow or accept. And here in Thessalonica, they, say, they don't say that. Now it's not pagans who are saying it. It's Jews. And they say, you know what, it's even worse than that. Not only are they stirring up the place, not only do they turn the whole world upside down, but they're actually breaking the decree of Caesar. That They're proclaiming there's a rival king named Jesus. Now, is what they're saying true, the Jews? Technically, it's true. Jesus as a king, right? That's what, that's what, when they said they were looking for a Messiah, they were looking for a king, right? They were looking for a son of David. In the Old Testament, David was a king, 
And a son of David would then therefore be a king. And they were looking for the king to come. That's who they're looking for. And Paul unapologetically says, Jesus is the king. So the Jews had that right. They knew enough to know that that's what Paul is claiming. By the way, when Jesus is before Pilate, it's the same charge brought against him. The king of the Jews. The same inscription that was above the cross where he was nailed. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. But see, here's the thing. Caesar didn't have to worry at this point about Jesus being a rival king trying to take over his kingdom. That wasn't the role at that time. But there is a day where he will do that. We sing the song where he will show up in robes of white. What we don't say is that he'll be showing up robes of white on a white horse with a sword that comes out of his mouth who destroys all of his enemies, that one day he will return. And as Daniel 2 says, he'll be the the, the rock cut without hands that that destroys every other kingdom. That one day he will return. As Daniel chapter 7 says, the Son of Man who comes up to the Ancient of Days and receives a kingdom that every other kingdom will fall down before. One day, Jesus will return as King, as the one and only true King. King, but not today. But not today. Caesar not, need not worry today. These are pretty serious charges that are bringing up against them. And luckily, Jason is in Thessalonica and not Philippi. Because when he gets dragged to the, the, the courthouse, when he gets dragged to the marketplace, instead of beating him, They just demand that he pay a bond so that Paul will no longer cause trouble. And so Jason pays it, and and they let him go. What was Paul guilty of again? Do you guys remember? Sharing the gospel. That's what Paul's guilty of. He's guilty of telling people about Jesus. He had the audacity to bring the good news that the king has come to save the day. That's what he's guilty of. Of telling folks that if you believe in him, you can have your sins forgiven and that you can have new life. That's what Paul is guilty of doing. But see, not everybody likes the good news. You see, Jesus is the king. But when you turn to him as the king, that means you have to turn away from all of the rival kings that you've pledged loyalty to. It means that that all of the false and the pretend kings that have demanded your allegiance and your obedience and have only given you pain and sorrow and slavery in return, you got to turn away from them to the true king. And the question is, what kings are you bowing down today? Right, what kings are you serving today that Jesus wants to release you from? Which ones do you need to let go of so you can let, lay hold of the true king? Fear, anger, lust, greediness. Overindulgence, laziness, envy. What are those things or the manifestations of those kings that have a hold of your heart? Let's take a look at verse 10. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. 
But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. So Paul is run out of yet another town. And so being run out of Thessalonica, he makes his way down to a place called Berea. So that's about 40 miles away. When Paul gets to Berea, he goes into the synagogue again, as was his custom. But this time, the reception's very different than it was before. Then when Paul begins to tell them about Jesus, they immediately go and they start looking through the scrolls. They immediately go and start looking at the Old Testament. They immediately start to go and say, is what Paul's saying true? Is it right? And it's, I love the way that Luke says it. He says that they, they received the word with great eagerness. You mean the Messiah's come? But then it says they examined the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And I hope that's true of you. I hope that you are in the habit of digging into God's Word for yourself and not just accepting whatever I or somebody else who up here might be saying. Right? I hope you're in the habit of, of digging in for yourself and seeing if these things are true. Because my fear is that we've gotten lazy and we've stopped asking the why questions. We've stopped trying to see if, whether or not what the person says, the talking head up here, if they're correct or not. And that's not just for church. That goes for things like social media and things like the news. Sorry, teachers, but also for teachers or anybody who is in authority. Right? That, 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 I, that we just accept, well, he's the pastor. Surely he's not going to lie to us. I hope. <laughs> or they said it on TV. The TV can't be wrong. And the internet always tells us the truth. I mean, by the way, I got it off their news feed, so they can't lie on that. Or my teacher said it. They're the expert in the field. And see what happens when we stop asking the why questions, when we stop digging into it for ourselves, when we stop examining to see, are these things lining up? Then we get led into all kinds of bad thinking and bad theology, right? And I'm not trying to start a, a revolution where your kids start saying, I'm not listening to my teacher. My pastor said I don't have to anymore. <laughs> I didn't say that. But I did say you should have a healthy curiosity that's looking for the truth. And not a, a um, distrusting skepticism that says, uh, I'm just going to try to prove you wrong, right? That, th that there should be that thing in you that says, okay, I hear what you're saying. Let me match this up to what God's Word says. Is this true? And then if it's not, psh, jettison it. But if it is, then you can lay hold of it and say, yes, that's it. When was the last time you examined the scriptures to see whether these things were so? The result of the Bereans questioning was that many of them believed, along with a number of God-fearing Gentiles. But both good and bad news travel fast. Even though there wasn't social media during that day, there was no internet, there were no phone uh, calls that could be made or anything like that, somehow 40 miles away uh, in Berea, the, the Thessalonians hear about what's going on and they send a delegation. Paul seems to be a lightning rod for people who don't like him. And so they come and they chase Paul out of town while Silas and Timothy hang back. So on this trip, there's Paul and, and Silas go into two different synagogues, one in Thessalonica, one in Berea. Two different results. 
In Thessalonica, that Paul uses the Old Testament scriptures and, and he reasons and he explains and he gives evidence that the, the Christ, the Messiah, had to die and then be raised. And he says, Jesus died and was raised, fulfilling everything that the Old Testament talked about. Jesus is the guy. And in Berea, that the, the, they heard what Paul had to say, and then they examined the Scriptures for themselves. And the difference is, a few believe versus many believed. In one place, they'd stopped asking the why question. One place, they, they'd gotten kind of set in their, in their ways. that they had, uh, they had preconceived ideas and notions of what life was supposed to be like and what the kingdom was. And, and they kind of liked the way the kingdom was working out for them. They did not have room for a rival king. So when Paul talks about Jesus, not going to have anything to do with it. But the other place, they're still asking the why questions. They're still uh, curious. They're still looking. We might say that they, that they, they were open and they, they were okay to be challenged and they were willing to challenge in return. That They were looking for the kingdom. They eagerly, when Paul said it, they go, man, that sounds like great news, but let me make sure. I don't want to be fooled, Paul. And when they did, when they found out that what Paul said was true, that they laid hold of their king. Which one of those two groups best describes you? Do you could it be say that you are eager? Is eagerness a word that can be used about your approach to Scripture? Right? Do you, do you come to it hungrily, eagerly looking? Do you examine the Scriptures daily to see whether what you're thinking, what you're hearing, what you're believing, what you're repeating, does it line up with the truth? Does it line up with what God says? If not, why not start today? The last thing I'll leave you with is this. The gospel is good news. And I think sometimes we have to be reminded of that because we live in a culture that is very, very, very anti-Christian. Jesus did come to save the day. He did come to right wrongs. He did come to set the captives free. But not every captive wants to be free, unfortunately. And for some of us, even in this room, we've fooled ourselves into thinking the life that we're living right now really is a life worth living. Despite the evidence to the contrary. Right? That the kingdom we're pursuing, we think that, oh, this must be the one that's going to bring me life. Even though we, we have the carnage left from bad choices and broken relationships and, and the fear and the, and the regret and, and the, uh, the worry and everything else that comes from it, we go, oh yeah, but somehow it's going to work out. You see, we proclaim a, a message of life. That Jesus came to bring you real life. And not the fake stuff. He came to bring you a real kingdom. Not the fake kind. He, he came to be the one and true king. And not a false one. But we can't think that, the, as a, a good friend of mine says, the devil's going to give us a free pass. Right? That, that he's going to allow us and say, hey, you know what? I, I, I've been holding all these people captive, but you come and take them. I'm tired. Now, see, it's going to mean that we have to storm the gates of hell. And like Paul, when one door closes, that we just keep going to the next. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for really just a reminder of how important the gospel is. That it is a life and death issue. 
that for Paul, it wasn't just a a hobby, it wasn't just an add-on to a life that he was already living, that was his life. It's a thing that got him up in the morning and a thing that he thought about when he went to bed at night. It was uh, compelled him because he knew he had the best news ever. And he just wanted to share it with as many people as he possibly could. And Father, I pray that we would have that same type of hunger, that same type of eagerness in sharing your uh, gospel with others, the good news that Jesus has come, that he had died a sacrificial death on our behalf, that he was raised the third day so that we might have new life. That real hope can be found in him. And Lord, as we think about Easter coming, we, I pray that, Lord, you would help us just to be on the lookout for those who, who we can invite, who need to hear the good news of the gospel. And Lord, I pray that in our day-to-day lives, we would be like Bereans who uh, examine your scriptures that, that we verify and that, that, Father, that we become strong proclaimers of the truth that we've, we've uh, received. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you, I pray today would be a day where they turn away from the the false kings in their lives and they turn toward you. One who is gracious and merciful, full of loving kindness and compassion. A king unlike any other king we've ever known who loves us beyond what we can imagine, who fights our battles for us, and will one day return to bring us home. And we say, Amen, come Lord Jesus.